things, like at this uh, business meeting, for example, and then review it sometime later and evaluate how happy that makes you. And, and you just see how you're doing and all things. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I, see, I think I got the title of Sweet's talk. If you haven't changed it. I changed it, sir. So. <laughs> okay. so, we'll let Steve introduce it. So, let's welcome yes. Steve. The only reason why Dom invited me is because I'm a cyclist too, you see. So I'm, I'm over 60 and I still ride my bike up the hill to campus, so that's a matter of pride for me. Okay. Designing technology against dystopia. Digital Interventions for Well-Being. Okay, that's so that's the, maybe this gets a prize for the longest title. Um, so, so I'm going to explain what this means, but basically what I'm going to argue is that um, recently, and perhaps with good reason, technology has been getting a very bad press. <coughs> and I want to argue that that um, may be true about the current generation of technology, but that doesn't mean in principle that technology necessarily has to be a negative thing in our lives. So what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about some of the work that we've been doing here at Santa Cruz, which is trying to develop different uh, technology interventions that can actually uh, improve people's uh, mental health and well-being. So I'll give you a few examples of those. Okay, so as I say, you know, at the moment, um, if you just tune into NPR or go to whatever your favorite news website is, um, you'll see that in general, technology is uh, not being reviewed particularly negatively, or positively, I should say. So I'm not expecting to read this, but basically, I typed in technology health Right? And I got back a million sites which basically say something along the lines of nine ways your smartphone is destroying your health. Have smartphones destroyed a generation? That's the Atlantic. So this isn't amazing fake news. Six ways your phone is hurting your health and happiness. Ten ways smartphones are destroying our lives. Six ways your phone is ruining your health. Why your smartphone is destroying your life. And that one's actually from psychology today. We have a few psychologists in the audience. So, and that one's, this one's actually from the UCLA website. So, this is, this is a common trope. This is a perspective that a lot of people now have. And then there's a bunch of um, interesting popular books. This is by Sherry Turkle, who's uh, an anthropologist at MIT. So, how many people have seen this book? So basically what, uh, what Sherry's argument is, is that we're spending so much time on our phones, that's actually weakening our connections with real life people. So I'm sure all of you have been to a restaurant and seen a couple who are out on a date, both with their phones out, right? <coughs> this should be illegal. <laughs> anyway, so, so, that's, that, so that's the kind of thing that she's talking about. So there's this focus on external other people when we're actually in a situation, a social situation. That's uh, another thing that's being criticized. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, you know, the quality of the data here. I'm just saying this is a thing that a lot of people are thinking about. And those of you who have grandkids, you know, I'm sure you've all worried about the extent to which they seem to be on their phones or their iPads from about 18 months old. Right? <laughs> okay, so this is the last thing that we're seeing. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the whole fake news debate. So this is uh, Sean Spicer. And basically, here he is, you know, uh, kind of uh, po-faced, and he's talking about how Trump's inauguration had the largest ever audience, you know, of all time throughout eternity on all planets, etc. So, so again, you know, lots of people are blaming. So, so that, you know, if you follow the Russia scandal, if you follow the Brexit scandal, a lot of people are saying that technology was instrumental in actually manipulating 
voter behaviors by subjecting people to information, susceptible people to information which was maybe not particularly accurate. Okay, so those are all reasons why right now we should be super suspicious of what technology is doing. So that's not what I do. I'm interested in a kind of different perspective, which is the idea that we can, rather than have technology kind of threaten aspects of our well-being and society, I'm more interested in uh, how we might actually think about designing new technologies that kind of make us better. Right? So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, what I'll say about the, the current approach is it kind of views technology as this immutable thing. It pre-exists and it's negative. And what I'm saying is, if we're strategic, we can think about new applications of technology that can actually extend and help us. But we have to think about technology in a different way. So this is just some verbiage which you know you can take or leave. But basically what, what I say is that we're trying to design technology as some kind of prosthesis to actually extend current human capabilities. And I'll give you uh, some examples of that. So what I want to do today is I want to take you through three examples. I'm not going to make an argument. I'm just going to show you stuff that we've built, uh, which I hope will convince you that you can actually build interesting new forms of technology that can actually be helpful to us. I'm going to talk, uh, talk about the, uh, the app that Dom referred to. So this is a mood tracking app, and this is not just a mood tracking app. It's an app that's meant, uh, or I'll provide examples of how that app can suggest ways to you that, of activities that you might engage in that might actually improve your mood or happiness. I'll get you, hold the skepticism, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Okay. The, the second app is along the same kind of lines, and what this does is it basically, um, it follows the same kind of approach, but what this app does is, if you're in a negative mood, it sends you positive past memories, and that way, you can actually manipulate your mood and make yourself happier. The last one here is not a mood app, this is an intentional app. So a lot of the rhetoric around um, the, uh, this kind of dystopian perspective on technology is around the fact that phones are just plain distracting us um, when we're trying to get stuff done. And so what this, what this app here does is it provides you with information about how you're spending your time at the moment, and I'll show you some evidence that we can actually help people, students and people in the workplace, be more focused if we, if we give them information about how they're using uh, their time. Okay? So two kind of emotions, emotion regulation tracking apps, one which is about focus, right? And we've actually, we built these apps so my, the, the method I'll talk about is that uh, I have teams of uh, undergrads and grad students. We build these apps. We put them out on the internet. We, we do deployments, uh, evaluative deployments, uh, often with students as part of experiments. Then we put them out on the open internet. So this uh, one of these, this one, is downloadable um, if you want to try it. Right? But the idea is we build stuff. We can kind of put it out so people can get the benefits of the research that we're doing here. Okay, so, you know, here's just a bit of kind of uh, sort of motivational information. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the background, why we're building these kind of mood apps and focus apps. And then I'll describe the method, which is we build the apps, we deploy them in the wild, right? Because I'm not so much interested in how people are using these things in lab, although we do that too. I think it's very difficult to do convincing um, lab experiments on um, these types of behaviors. And then what we do in the deployments of this technology is we have multiple variants of an app and we compare the different variants so we can actually make comparisons about what the optimal design of the application is. So we measure the effects of the deployment and then we use that to make decisions about what the best design for this kind of app is. Okay, so that's the general approach. And I will say, please ask me questions because 
Yeah, I mean, many of you guys, many of you guys are used to lecturing. You don't want to hear somebody talk all the time, right? Please, you know, have a question, any question, I'm totally up for it, okay? Okay, so just uh, a little bit of background from a psychology perspective. So there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that people don't have very good insight into their emotions. So um, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that if you ask people how they are likely to feel in the near future, they're not very good at making predictions uh, about the near future. They tend to be overly influenced by things that have just happened and past negative events. Um, they're also poor at uh, regulating their emotions. So if you're in a negative mood, psychologically what happens is that tends to prime negative memories or negative thoughts, so that kind of feeds in on itself, so negative mood begets uh, even more negative mood. And then there's quite a lot of evidence now that suggests that people who are good at regulating their uh, emotions, um, people uh, who have good skills at that, they're more likely to uh, enjoy good physical health, they live longer, they have better jobs, and they have better social and professional relationships. So that's kind of what we're going after. So we're trying to help people better regulate their emotions because there are kind of societal and personal consequences uh, for being able to do that. And so this is just kind of uh, you know, a, a very high level view on what the app does. Um, what I'll do is I'll describe two systems and they, these systems have two goals. One is that they, they, they're intended to help people better understand their emotions and mood. So we kind of see, we make the technology so it's some kind of mirror to your emotions because we know people aren't very good at reflecting on their emotions. And then the second thing the system is intended to do is to actually improve your emotional state. In other words, it's intended to make you happier, right? But we need these kind of diagnostics before we can actually um, make suggestions to you about activities you can engage in uh, to uh, improve your future. <laughs> so, um, you know, just, just to be a little bit more specific about it, um, so how we feel at any point in time is affected by many factors. Right? So how are you guys are feeling? You're probably feeling better now, you've had a little bit of a drink, you've had a bit of a chat, um, you've had something to eat, you're probably better than you were at 11.30. You're feeling more positive about this, right? And that is, you know, that is what the uh, health science suggests. So basically, how our current feeling, our current feelings, our current mood, depends on a, a multiplicity of different factors. So when each of us is trying to think about uh, our current emotional state, it's kind of hard for us to make predictions or understand the role of those factors because there are a lot of factors which are contributing to current mood and also it's highly possible that they could interact. In other words, you, if you have a poor night's sleep, that might not completely destroy your mood, but if you have a poor night's sleep and you don't exercise, that might be the thing that really depresses your mood. So first of all, a lot of factors contribute to mood, and secondly, they might interact in quite complex ways. So as I say, the first system I want to talk about today, there's a diagnostic component, which help pe helps people to better understand what factors are contributing to their mood. And then there's a second part to the system, which is this part, which I'll describe in a bit more detail in a minute, which actually makes recommendations to people about activities they can engage in to make themselves feel better in the future. So, uh, how does the system work? It's on your phone. So, uh, I guess almost everybody now has a smartphone. Um, I guess uh, the penetration in the work, uh, I guess the general penetration of smartphones is now between 90 and 95% in, in the US. So, so what happens with the application is, a couple of times per day, you get a prompt from your phone, and it says, how are you feeling, right? And that's the mood prompt, and on the basis of that, um, you tell it that you're feeling, you know, pretty negative or pretty positive. 
and then it asks you a bunch of quick questions. Uh, so it says, um, it asks you um, how you've eaten, how you've slept, whether you've exercised, and then these are, because everybody's kind of different, people can set up um, their own personal um, factors, set of factors that are actually contributing to their mood. So that's the first part. You generate uh, a mood rating and you generate uh, a set of explanations for yourself about what factors are supposed to be contributing to your mood. And on the basis of this, after a couple of weeks of using the app, we can build a statistical model of what factors predict your mood, right? And I'm gonna say one technical thing and you can take it or leave it, right? So what I'm gonna say is, for those of you who are interested in statistics, this model that we have explains about 63% of the variance, right? And the people here who are social scientists will be absolutely astonished about that level of accuracy because this is behavior for people, everyday behavior for people in controlled settings, in uncontrolled settings, and we're still getting uh, relatively strong predictions. And that's important because you want to have a relatively accurate model when you want to make predictions to people about things that they might do on the basis of the model that you have. Okay, so anybody, any questions? So this is the diagnostic component. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to say for you, as a person, we're trying to build a model which says um, the important <coughs> thing for, let's say, you, is if you're gonna be happy, you have to sleep well. The important thing for, let's say, you, is if you're gonna be happy, then you have to exercise and you have to eat well, right? So each person will have an individualized model that's built off the reportings that they've done to us. Yes? This is to me <clears throat> to leave an important factor in mood, and that is when you're interacting with other people, your yes. colleagues, your friends, your family. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, that, so that is it another... Nothing so to do with food, sleep, or exercise. It has to do with your interaction, if your interaction is yeah, yeah, positive. So that, yeah, 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 so that's in the, you, I'm just not showing it. That's, there's, social interaction is in there. Social interaction, mm -hmm. yes. I think, is very important. Yes, and that's, sorry, that's just not shown on this particular, that's part of the model, right? And it's important for some people, it's not so important for other people. But yes, that's in that, yes. Okay, so that's, that's the basic model. And then what we do, off the base of this model is that we make, um, we show people um, this so-called mood graph. So let's say today is Saturday. Now you're all retired, you don't really know what day of the week it is. <laughs> That's a terrific thing and I'm looking forward to that. My daughter just got back from college and she said to me, what day of the week is it? And I thought, fantastic. That's a great situation to be in. Anyway, so let's pretend it's Saturday, but we don't care, right? So these are the mood ratings you gave yesterday, uh, sorry, yesterday, the day before, and today. And what we can do, now that we have this statistical model based off information that you've given us, is we can make a prediction about how you're likely to feel tomorrow and the day after, right? And then what we do with the system is we make recommendations to you about activity based of your personal model. We make recommendations to you about activities that you might schedule, which are likely, which if you do schedule them and you do act upon them, are likely to improve your mood, right? <laughs> so for this particular person, we make recommendations of their particular model that they should, that if they engage in particular eating activities or particular social activities, right, so this could even be your model here, then we ask people, the app, what the app does is it asks people to schedule those activities in at a specific time, and what we do is we show you the results for you on your mood if you happen to schedule those activities. All right, so basically we have a predictive model, and what we say is, if tomorrow you decide that you're going to have your favorite dish, whatever that is, followed by planning some social activity, then your mood will change from this to this. Right? So that's the, that's the, the goal of the application, is to get people to change their habits based off a model that we're building of them. Okay? So that's how the thing works. Has anybody got 
and we've tried, before we deploy these things, we try them out with different people, so we make sure that everybody can understand what this means, and we've tried various different ways of showing this information in such a way that the average person can understand, you know, what this data means, and also the average person knows how to click on these things and schedule uh, an appointment for themselves the next day. Is the model construction occurring within the cell phone itself? Yes. Or external oh. at a cloud site? Yeah, sorry. So in this version, we basically build the models on a server. Okay. Is that a security question you're asking yeah. me? It is a security question. Yes. So we've experimented with both. Right? Mm -hmm. For computationally, right. it's clear, right? Computationally, you want to do it on the server side. Yeah. Security, you want to do it on the client side, right? We can talk more. Yeah. There's pros and cons. There's no great solution, right? right? right. Yeah. This shows an improvement uh, on, the, on the next day, yes. but none on the day after. <laughs> That's because we haven't made a recommendation to you, right? So um, we, when, when it, when this becomes today, on Monday, you'll get some recommendations here. But so we're not asking you to schedule, we're just asking you to schedule for tomorrow. We're not, we will ask you tomorrow to schedule for the day after. Right, except that the impact of what you do tomorrow doesn't seem to impact the day after. It will because the model will update. <laughs> Right, so, so tomorrow we'll ask you for your actual moon data, so this graph will then become an actual, and then everything will shift this way, so we'll say, how about doing these two things the day after tomorrow, and then you'll see this exact. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens is when, you, when the graph first comes up, you haven't scheduled these things, so there's nothing there, right? You schedule them, then you see this, right? Yeah. What data do you have to say that people are always interested in food? That's a very good question. So I will say right now that um, we are supposed to be in uh, what's called an anxiety epidemic, right? So if you've been following um, the statistics, right? So, so I know that's an unfortunate uh, set of terminology, but basically, um, what is true is that if you uh, give uh, surveys to young adults, so I guess these are cohort-based surveys, what's showing is that young adults are increasingly using terms of depression and anxiety to, to characterize themselves, right? So if, if, I don't know, I can't speak to the general population, because there's all sorts of issues about stigma of declaring yourself to have mental illness, and that might be or just simply being down, those things are changing. But I will say that statistics on young adults are that they are increasingly self-presenting as being anxious. And I'll say from a personal perspective, I'm getting more students coming along to me, and it used to be um, some kind of environmental event would, you know, so they'd say, can I have an extension, um, you know, because uh, somebody stole my computer, now I have a lot of requests for extensions which are based around uh, mental health episodes. So I, I think there is, there is an argument certainly for young adults that this, and I mean, I, I, I don't know why I'm saying, we, we've just done two surveys, we've just done two large scale surveys where for these types we've said, you can have an out health app that does anything for you, what do you want? And they say, top two are stress tracking and mood tracking. So that's two surveys we've just put out. Right, so I don't know why I could, didn't answer that better before. Yeah. Just while you're interrupting, for all of this stuff, how much do you go through institutional review boards? That's a very good question. So all of this, because of course this is, you know, so I think that's a great question. I mean, they're all great questions, I, I know. I, <laughs> but, 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 but so, so I think that's, that's really important because if you go onto the internet and you type mood tracking app, you'll get 90,000 hits, right? And lots of that's going to be snake oil, isn't it? Yeah, because, I mean, so what, there's nothing, so of course, you, you know, I couldn't say, I've got some great new drug, 
right? I'm going to put it out on the internet. You know, I've got some, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to extract uh, uh, extract of uh, arachnid juice, and that's really good for mood. I can put that out now on the internet and sell that to people without being sick. But I can do that with mood tracking apps right now, right? So yes, we have IRB. Right, and and that's real, and it's really important we do these types of studies before we actually put this stuff out on the internet. So uh, yeah, I think it's a real problem now because there's just a bunch of just unregulated stuff out there, which because of these considerations about mood depression, you know, people, kids might be downloading this stuff, and it's maybe just no good, right? But there's nothing to stop companies doing that right now. Um, I think just a. Yeah. Quick question uh, for a comment. Uh, there was news reports about Microsoft running this chat room in China yeah. where it's actually completely computer driven. Yes. And the kids chat to it and respond yes. back, tries to improve their mood, yeah. or this or that. Are you familiar with that at all? So I'm not familiar with that very specific example, but I do know that there's various companies in Silicon Valley right now, which are testing versions of technology that's very like that. Now, if, if are you, so empirically, I think, so the question is, yeah. I'm, I'm, I have no objections to chatbots per se, if they work, yeah. right? And that's an empirical <coughs> question. So, so long as you do the right studies, and you deploy those things in the right kind of way, and you measure mm -hmm. the right kind of things, they could help people, and I think there is reason to think they may help people. And because of this kind of uh, anxiety epidemic, it might be that we need automatic services to help people things. So I wouldn't necessarily rule out totally automated services, but we have to prove them for the same reason that you just brought up, right? Because it's all, you know, it's all empirical, right? Okay. So, so everybody got at least a working idea of, of what, what the application does and you, you know, uh, how it actually works. So, so now what I want to do is I, is I want to talk about this question of, you know, so how good is it? So what we do is um, we build different versions of the system. So we, have, we design different versions of the software and then we deploy them in the wild. Right? That's to say we have people download the software. These are people we pre-profiled, so we want to know things about those people for reasons I'll come, in, come on to in a minute. We deploy those. We have people use the system um, for anything between three weeks and a month, and then we measure various effects of using the system uh, in ways that I'll just describe. Right? So, um, so it's, it's not a clinic. It's, it's close to being a clinically controlled trial, but it's, it's not quite because there's, I guess there's uh, very small details in which it's different. But if you're, if you're familiar with EPN and clinical trials, very similar procedure. So what I want to talk about now is we deploy two versions of the system. The one that I just showed you which does this kind of prediction and recommendation, right? And the other one that just simply monitors your mood, right? So in this version, all you're doing is you get a mood prompt multiple times per day, and then it says to you, you say, I'm this happy, and then it says, what factors do you believe are contributing to your mood? Right? So that's the first part of the system I showed you. Now the reason why we have this as a control in there is because there's a large number of systems, kind of free or low-cost systems that are out there that do this. And we're interested in, this is what we think is different or unique about what we're doing, so we want to test the additional effects, if there are any, of deploying this additional bit of technology, right? So this is kind of state of the art, this is the new thing that we're building, okay? So this is a very complicated diagram, but, you know, don't worry about it, you know. So basically, what we kind of, we have monitoring only people, we have our full system which has that prediction component, and then we have what's called a wait list or a do-nothing control. So these are people who sign up for the study, but we say we're full up, and we just want to measure whether they're, they changed in the period that we've actually deployed the system. Okay, and the, inter the thing that we're, so we use the way that we measure the effects of the system are, we pretest people on various anxiety scales um, or beliefs about their emotions, 
before they start using the system and after they've used the system. And the thing we're interested in is, do their beliefs change? Okay, so let me just show you the results. So these are people who are just monitoring in the way I described. So they get a mood prompt, they're asked what factors contribute to their mood. These are the people who are doing the uh, emotional forecasting. And these are the people, these are the weightless control, right? So basically what happens is um, that this group uh, are more likely to do two things. They are more likely to um, engage in activities that will change their future mood. So in other words, if a bike ride is a really good thing for your mood, once you use our system, you're more likely to schedule activities like that. And also, you're more likely to believe that those activities are successful. Right? So that's the idea of the system. One idea of the system is that we're actually trying to get people to engage in more of these types of activities. And then the second thing, another thing that we're doing, obviously, is we're tracking people's mood on a daily basis. And so uh, what we see here is that people who are using our system are likely to be happier, on a, have a better mood on a day-to-day -day basis than people who are just kind of monitoring their emotions. So this is the thing, you know, we're supposed to be boosting people's happiness. That works. And then we have this other question, which is kind of interesting, in my view, which is kind of like it's, it's a question which is about whether or not, to the extent to which people feel they have control over their emotions and their mood. So one of the key questions here is, my emotions seem to belong to me, and what's the case is that for people who are using the emoticar version, that's the predictive version of the system where they're scheduling their activities, they're more likely to believe that their emotions are things that belong to them and that things that they can actually control. So that's one of the, so um, I guess, um, that is uh, similar to the notion of self-efficacy, if you're kind of familiar with that idea. So, so those are some quantitative results which show that the system's working in the way uh, that we wanted it to. Now, the other thing that we want to do in the context of these types of studies is we want to see how is the system actually having the effect uh, that uh, it seemed to be having. So if you recall, what we're asking people to do when we get the move prompt from them is we're asking them to post short explanations of what, uh, short textual explanations uh, for why they think they felt the way that they did. And so we can use um, automatic textual analysis methods to analyze those types of reasons. And what we expected is people who are using the forecasting version of the system are more likely to have insight, to be using terms associated with insight, and to be using more terms associated with explanation in the context of their mood. So I won't go into the details of kind of how uh, the program actually works, but, you know, but here's a person who's in the forecasting group, they say that, so something like, I realize, <laughs> right? So that's a verb of insight, I still feel bad, because I spent too much money and was out too late, right? So this person seems to be understanding a relationship between activities they engage in and a feeling that they have, right? And this is much more prevalent, this type of explanation is much more prevalent in the people who are doing that emotional forecasting that I just described for you, right? So those are, that's some stats for you if you're into stats. Okay, and so then we do these exit interviews with people. So they finish the uh, they finish the study. We ask them, you know, what was the system doing for you? And so, you know, here are a couple of selected quotes, but they're kind of so. This is these are people who are using the emotional forecasting app. They say things like, "I'm more aware of the different things that affect my mood. I think that's valuable to see how things would affect my mood. For instance, sleep." my job and partner. I don't really think I gave it much thought about that until I could actually see it in visual sets. So this is more insight into the factors underlying mood. And right, and this is more about feeling that you can control over your mood. You realize you really do have the ability to change your mood. 
right? So they filter them all effective. You know that you do have the power to actually, you know, go from a zero to a plus one. Those are on the scale. It makes you accountable. Okay? So this is insight. This is kind of like a feeling that you can kind of change the way that your mood is. Okay, so that's the first deployment. You know, so I've taken quite a long time on that one. Um, but does anybody have any questions, right? Yes. You know, I have a question. Have yes. we done follow up? I'm curious about the permanence of this. Good, not, great question. Not doing the monitoring. Yeah, great question. So, not for this particular app, but let me show you for a similar app. And this is, to me, it's. Okay, so this is this is a similar app, right? And so what we and these are these are different um, uh, well-being happiness scales, right? And so this is evaluation at pre-test, post-test. This is after using the system for a month, and then we go back to them four months later, right? Now, what's really interesting is these are the. I'm just looking at the people who have not been using the application. Right? So we have some people who are still using the application. Right? These are people who have not been using the application. And what you see is that for some of these well-being measures, people are continuing to, to improve three months after they've not been using the application. So it's kind of like they've internalized the lesson, right? and they're continuing to exercise it. So they have self-feedback that they're feeling... Yeah, so basically, let's say... Let's say, I mean, let's, let's say you never realized that hanging out with this particular person profoundly depressed you, right? <laughs> and that's something you learned from the app. I'm na naming no names. We're all friends here, right? Okay, let's say that's something you learned from the app, right? Well, you, you don't need to still be running the app if, if that's all, you, you know, I, I really enjoy it if I engage it, you know, maybe it's like, um, I just get such a kick out of playing bridge, I should do it more often. Right? And you say, okay, well that's something I'm going to try and do on a weekly basis. Right? But you're not using it, you don't need to use the app anymore because you've internalized it. So this this for me, you know, I'm I'm really sorry, I'm excited about everything, but I'm really excited about this type of result because it's relatively long term. And we have people for this app, we have people who are using the app after a year. Right? But what I'm talking about here is the people who drop the app, they're still getting something from the experience. So did I see? So 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 look. So I've been talking for about forty minutes. I can do I can do another one that's similar, right? Again, which is about emotion. But why don't I why don't I talk a little bit about focus, which is a rather different type of app, and then and then we can you know so we'll have something different, not more of the same. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to skip over um, the next bit of the talk, and then let's. Okay, so what do I mean by focus? Well, this is like the big concern of kind of like millennial parents, right, Isabel? The big concern of millennial parents is how can those kids get any homework done, right, when they've got social media? So I used to watch, obviously not Isabel, but I used to watch Isabel's brother, who can't be with us today, obviously. So he'd be doing his homework in the kitchen, and he'd be into social media, every two minutes, like a really quick check, and you know, and then he'd be back on his homework, right? And I don't know about your ability to concentrate, but it takes, <laughs> takes me about 20 minutes to half an hour to kind of get my head into whatever I'm doing, and the notion that I could be like working on an essay and then flipping out to social media, you know, whatever it is, looking at a bunch of pictures for 12 seconds and then coming back, in, you know, it, it makes my head spin. Anyway, so, so, so that's, that's the con concern of a lot of you know, parents and grandparents about their kids. And part of it, you see, the obvious reason why things have got that way is if you look at a phone or you look at a computer, it used to be, so, so let's say in the good old days, right, if let's say you didn't feel like working, right, and let's say you want to watch a movie, uh, you know, or you want to kind of quickly chat with your friends, what you'd have to do is 
stop working on whatever you were working on and go to the movie theater, right? So that's a big effort, you know, you'd have to plan that. Right now, I have a bunch of students who in the course of the study I'm just about to talk about, they say that while they're doing their homework or while they're doing their, uh, their research, their essay, they're watching movies, <laughs> right? And they can do that on, the, the temptation is everything's right here for you on the same device, right? So it's not like we didn't have these temptations in the past, it's that we couldn't realize them immediately. Right? And so the same thing, you know, the same thing is true of social media, that you know, maybe you're getting a little bit bored with the research you're doing on your essay because it's getting a bit tough. Oh well why not I just see whether so anybody's responded to that, you know, really funny picture I posted. I'll tell you about the funny picture I was unable to post uh, maybe after the talk. But anyway, so does everybody have the idea why concentration and focus are a problem with modern technologies if you didn't already clearly have that idea before I started talking, right? So it's just because you can do everything on this device. Okay, so now just a little bit of background research. So these to me are astonishing statistics. So there's now instrumentation of both students and people at work. Uh, so basically they have a program which watches how you're using the applications on your computer. And astonishingly, people at work and students spend less than one minute in each application before they change it. Right? In other words, let's say you're trying to write an essay in Word or you're an office worker and you're trying to write some kind of report. Well, on average, you spend less than 60 seconds on that report before you go out to some other app, right? And part of the reason for that is clear is you might be, let's say you're an office worker and you're writing, you're trying to write a report together with a bunch of other people. Well, those people might be emailing you stuff that's relevant to your report, but surely they can't be emailing you at that kind of rate. But this is real data, this is real instrumented, uh, systems on people's computers. So this is the kind of problem that we're looking at, right? So this is severe, severe attention fragmentation. And as I say, people used to think it's like, oh, they're getting emailed all the time, or people are texting them all the time. No, right? About half the time, people are self-interrupting here, right? And some of that is uh, that people need information from these other apps, and other of the time, it's just like, I'm kind of fed up with what I'm doing. Okay, and, and so there's other research, in particular by Gloria Mark, who's at uh, UCI, that basically shows that the more you tend to engage in this kind of fragmentation type behavior, the re re reduction, you have reduced productivity and increased perceived stress, right? So, um, you know, forgive me, Isabel. So, so, you know, you talk to a lot of millennials and they say, huh, well, of course, we, we, we multitask and we're really good at it. Right? So we're just being more efficient. It's factually not true. Right? There is no evidence. So millennials, you know, that's, you know, kids of what's the definite, what's the highest age a millennial could be, 28? So, so millennials, they, they believe that they're more efficient at multitasking and consequently multitask more, but there's no evidence that that makes them more productive. Okay, so anyway. Yeah, Cliff Nash showed that the people that multitask the most are the worst at it. Yes, right, so it might be, yes, exactly. So that he has some very interesting evidence that there may be quite deep-seated attentional problems that those people have. Namely, they can't suppress irrelevant information when they're trying to focus on something. Unlike the rest of us, things that should not be uh, kind of paid attention to, they tend to be overly attentive to. Okay. So that, anyway, that's the kind of setup. So we think attention is a problem. We think that using computers is a big problem. So we did, we went out, we talked to a bunch of uh, uh, computer users, and we basically, so we said, you know, tell us about how your work habits are. Uh, you know, do you have problems with attention? So what we see from people is that many people are fundamentally dissatisfied with how they use their time. And one of the big problems people have is their inability to monitor off-task activities. What do I mean by that, right? So here's an example. Right, it's very difficult to be aware of things. You dip into email.
email for 10 minutes, but you might be unaware that half the day has gone if you keep doing it, right? So you're working on a task, you think, oh, I'm wondering whether uh, that person sent me that email. You go and check email. We're really poor at monitoring the time that we spend doing these things. That all adds up in the context of the day. This person who provided this quote was actually a, um, I guess he was a dean at our university. <laughs> so this is not, this is not only kids, right? Okay, this is a, another person. With the browser, it's easy to get absorbed in a cumulative aspect when you start one page and then several links down the road, you've wasted an hour or so, right? So this is kind of the lost, the lost on the web experience, right? You go off to do a little bit of research and then suddenly you're looking into, you know, I don't know, great, seven great ways that cauliflower can change your relationship. <laughs> How did I get that? <laughs> okay, so, 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 so that, those are the kind of problems, and these, these are problems that are problems for students, they're problems for, for people who are, you know, working in jobs, and we interview both. So, so what we did was, you know, so, so the reason why I say this is an ironic intervention is because it's like technology is the problem, right? So what we say is, oh, well, let's throw some more technology at it, because that's obviously the solution, right? So, so what the app does is it just tells you about how you're using your time, right? So this is the thing that people told us they were very bad at, tracking how they're using their time. And what the app just simply does is it shows you how you've allocated your recent attention. So here's what it looks like. It's not very complicated. So what this just basically says to you is, in the last 30 minutes, you've spent a lot of your time in Adobe Acrobat. You've spent a lot of your time in using a sticky note. You've spent a moderate amount of your time in email. And you've spent some part of your time in Facebook. Right? And that's all the app does. It's constantly tracking how you're using the app. And so, so this app sits on your computer screen and you can't dismiss it. Right? And that's absolutely key. That's absolutely key. Because if you could dismiss it, then that wouldn't be. So again, going back to the parental thing, sorry, Isabel. Let's so, so, so you know, I the analogy would be like you had a really annoying parent saying, how much time you spent in Facebook in the last half an hour, right? How much time did you spend on WhatsApp in the last, right? That's all the app's doing is it's rendering to you information about your recent use of time, right? Because this is the thing that people say they're bad at, okay? So just, so I'll, I'll just be really quick. So we do this same kind of thing here, except that what we do is some days people use the app, some days they don't use the app, right? Because people are so variable. So this is a within subject uh, manipulation. And basically, we ask a bunch of questions pre and post, which I can talk about if people are interested, but it's the overall time use stats that are more interesting. Okay, so people who use our app, it, over, it reduces the amount of time uh, that they use on the computer per day by 3.5 hours. I'll say that again. It reduces the amount of time that people spend on their computer by 3.5 hours. Pretty astonishing. On their computer, not for work. This is all the time they're on the computer. All the time they're on, I'll show you, as uh, right? So it reduces Facebook usage by 44%. It reduces internet browsing usage by 22%. It reduces email usage by 30%, right? Now here's the interesting thing. Productivity applications, Word, uh, PowerPoint, Excel, there's no change, right? So what, what it's doing for people is it's, it's allowing them to kind of control their use of kind of, kind of non-core apps. So here's the overall stat. This is the total time in minutes, right? So people go from being uh, you know, over 800 minutes a day on the computer to about 600, 570. OK, and this is your question. So, so here we, we see. So, this is the, so <clears throat> blue is when they're using me time, red is when they're not, right? So what you see is um, productivity apps, no difference, reduced email, uh, reduced browsing, reduced Facebook. 
So I guess that was the most interesting thing to us. Yeah. I'm confused if the productivity time doesn't change, what happens to the time that it's sitting and reduced from the other tasks? Thank you. They're just not using their computer. They're walking away from their computer. Right? So, 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 so what we're seeing here is you work exactly the same amount of time, but what you're not doing is you're not sitting on Facebook uh, or you're maybe not watching movies on your computer for two and a half hours a day in addition to whatever you did. You're now aware of the fact you're on your computer, so you stop doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> what about your student who's doing all of those things simultaneously? They're all open on the screen. How does the app monitor that? It just basically, so, it, it, so you get information from the operating system about what's, quote, in focus, right? So, so basically now, the only app that I have in focus is PowerPoint, right? If I brought Word up, the only app I would have in focus is, is Word, right? And that's something the operating system just yields up to. Okay, so I'll be, be really quick. Um, okay, so, so we also, um, we interviewed people and we found that their perception of how they use time changed. By the end of the, my first day of awareness logging, that's using the app, I spent much less time engaging in unproductive breaks and spent the majority <coughs> of the time on ta that task. Having to hold myself accountable made this epiphany all the more apparent. So, I'm done. <laughs> so, Thanks to what these are students, uh, undergrad and grad students. We have um, NSF funding um, for this style of research. And then, as I say, that's the general approach. Happy to take any questions.